So now we're going to switch to, to the second part of our, of our conference. Uh, after we have completed the definition and the legal side of crypto investment, now we're going to, to listen to crypto investors. Crypto investors that can be a variety of people. It can be big funds, it can be traders, and it can be individuals. So in this part of the conference, you will listen to approximately every class of investor, from the biggest one to the smallest ones. And we're going to discuss the emergence of these, uh, these investment uh, trends. And uh, so the first, uh, the first topic now is about, the, the, about crypto funds. <coughs> crypto funds is the funds that are specially dedicated to investing in these crypto assets. Uh, and uh, I wanted to to have news from France, as well as from other countries, how all this is, is developed. So, um, uh, we are going to hear of Federico, who is coming specially from Brazil. Uh, he's created the first Brazilian crypto fund, which is Brazilian crypto fund, yes, in that case. So, uh, coming from Brazil, especially for the conference, I really would like to vote. Good afternoon, and good evening. I say to Adrian, um, for every 1,000 miles, I should get um, at least 10 minutes to speak. So. Yes, so we're going to do this in front of the dogs. Obrigado. Well, I've uh, passed a long time. I've already French, but today it's impossible, so let's move on in English. Uh, so, uh, just a second. I, I'm going to present briefly everyone. Uh, so, the second uh, fantastic speaker who came from far perhaps closer from France than Brazil, is Anton Tito, who's coming from Moscow, or from St. Petersburg, from Russia. From Russia. Yes. And uh, uh, you are the vice president of what you call a crypto bank, a crypto investment bank. A crypto investment bank, right. Yes. Perfect. Uh, now, uh, Jacopo Proietti uh, is uh, well. some of the... Some of you know him because he is in France, but he's an Italian guy and he's a, a big specialist of the crypto environment in several European countries, including in Italy. So he's going to tell us a little bit about Italy. Uh, Joshua, you're also in France, but uh, you know what happens in the United States and Mexico. So you will tell us a little bit about what happens here. And of course, uh, Olivier Ramey uh, from the big French uh, fund of funds uh, is going to tell us a little bit about the, the situation in France and the few crypto funds who are, uh, who are emerging. And perhaps Paul Bounou, uh, he's a little bit late, he told me he's coming, is the creator of one of the first and biggest crypto funds in France. So <coughs> expecting him, he will come <coughs> during this round table a little bit. So, um, let's start from, from far away. <laughs> Frederico, you, you wrote on your, on your site that you that you made uh, three thousand percent or one thousand. Yeah, but that's a round number. Actually, it was two thousand nine hundred and eighty. Oh yes, almost three thousand percent in six months. In six months. Oh, congratulations! So tell tell us a little bit about Brazil. Are there a lot of crypto funds there? Uh, a lot of other types of investors. Are people excited about crypto? Um, yes, actually, in, in Brazil. Well, first of all, we have a taxation that's much better than in France. That. That's not something that you can say about uh, too many things about Brazil, but it's only 15% uh, on capital gains. So there is a, 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 it's much easier for people to get into crypto. And since last year, uh, when I started fund, I, I'm still the only one uh, doing as a fund, and now we are moving to merging people from the other countries into a full solution for crypto. Uh, but today, so we have few uh, institutional investors because the regulation does not allow uh, institutional investors to invest in crypto yet. But from an individual point of view, there's a lot of Brazil. Um, in the last uh, Bitcoin rally, um, November and December, when crypto was all over the world and CBC and Channel 4 and in Brazil was TV Global every night, uh, Brazil had so many people coming into crypto that it, I, I believe it's, it was the first and probably the only one that has more, more people with crypto accounts 
uh, with accounts in a crypto exchange, exchange than people with accounts in stock exchange. So uh, the exchange went from like four or five employees in September to over a hundred in December and January. So um, I would say that uh, different from France, we already have a lot of people investing, but as individual, not as institutions. No, thank you very much. So, uh, um, so this is Brazil. Uh, what about? Uh, can you tell us a little, a few words of, uh, from Mexico, Joshua? Do you have crypto investors there? Do you have crypto funds? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there are some. Uh, there are not so many as in other countries because um, there are not so many exchanges, but. It's true that a lot of retail investors are investing in crypto, and now we think that institutional investors are coming. Um, maybe those one those investors are going to make the prices recover. Uh, the Zachary Reese, uh, an American investor, uh, he founded Block Trade Investment. He, he he should have come here, but he canceled his flight for family reasons. So he could have told us a lot about the situation in the United States. It's a big pity that he's not here. But perhaps you could tell us something about the United States. Yes, uh, and I think it's the same logic for every country about the institutional investors. And one reason is because in the United States, they already uh, launched the, the, the re derivatives products, futures, uh, who underlie, uh, the underlying product is, is Bitcoin. So that's a way how big players can access the market. So uh, the, well, the thing is that they launched this product at the end of December, uh, but this is a, 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 a way how big players can come in. Um, but do you think the, uh, the US market with this regulation, uh, isn't it? Uh, would say uh, a very big obstacle for the development of these industries. Um, yes and no, because uh, concerning, for example, Bitcoin, the product is already there, so investors can go in. Now the difficulty or the, the more um, complex issues are uh, ICOs. So um, I think that's the main problem in the well in all of countries. How to regulate ICOs, but concerning uh, concerning Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, regulators have already decided that it's, it's, it's legal. It can be used. It can be uh, it can invest. Okay. Regulated. So they are more tolerant towards cryptocurrencies than towards ICOs, right? As in other countries, as a rule. Mm. Uh, Anton, would you tell us a few words about the situation in Russia? Yeah, so, uh, oh, just a second. I would like to remind something about Russia. Um, Russia uh, is a superpower in the field of ICOs and blockchain. Look, uh, we made a statistic with ICO Bench a few months ago. We discovered something incredible. Russia is um, half percent, half percent of the global venture market. There are more investment in startup in France every month than in Russia during the year. It's ridiculous. But when it comes to ICOs, Russia alone is 10% of the global market in number of ICOs and approximately 10%. It's very difficult to count because uh, sometimes they don't say that from Russia or from they have registered in Switzerland or something like that. And Many countries don't really, it's not easy to identify precisely where the projects are coming from, but still, we studied, took into account these different variations, and with ICO Bench, we estimated that uh, uh, Russia is about 10% of the numbers of, of the number of ICOs last year, in 2017, and approximately 10% as well uh, of the, the, the funds raised through ICO. So Russia is a very, very important country, at least in the 
is the fact that many Russian entrepreneurs are launching ICOs, in particular because there's a little, there's not a lot of venture capitalists. So Russian startups entrepreneurs, some of them, they cannot have access to, there are not enough venture funds locally. Uh, and there's international tension, so uh, Western investors would not go a lot to Russia to invest in startups. So many Russian entrepreneurs, they, they would launch an ICO to, as a crowdfunding, a new way of, of raising money from everywhere in the world. So this is a, perhaps a part of the explanation of why Russia is such a big power in terms of ICO. But internal investors, uh, so you have plenty of ICOs, uh, but what about investors? Are, are there plenty of investors? Who are they? Uh, are they? Tell us about your investment bank, the other funds, and the other classes of investors. Uh, yeah, so uh, in Russian investing uh, landscape, there is not so many institutional investors as everywhere. Uh, and uh, the old investors, they usually come from the either fintech or like some kind of technical venture. So it's some kind of seasoned um, businessmen uh, where they can uh, be able to invest their, uh, their venture, their, their money. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the whole landscape, it's like can be divided into like more technical areas, technical segments. It's uh, the relative trading uh, funds, little trading funds, which do some manual trading or elder trading, the relative players, uh, but their uh, overall size of the portfolio is not so large because the whole trading strategies doesn't allow the large portfolio. So it's not usually more than one billion. Uh, so another big segment is of course ICOs. And there are like uh, sectors of the, some kind of incubate, incubators, which are based uh, uh, on the current fintech companies, on the payment companies, on the companies which did ICO maybe one year ago, and now they're having their incubators. And on the other hand, uh, really big players, big consortium, which uh, we are part of, it's just uh, private ICOs, only pre-sales, which um, can give really good uh, return of investment even on the standing market. So moreover, it's like more technical, more speculative, like uh, not very strategic thinking of investments, but more like uh, technical best and uh, like speculative. Thank you, Spasima. Uh, Olivier, would you like to tell us a few words about the situation in France? Sure. So first of all, I live uh, only one kilometer away from, uh, from this place, so based on your rule, I think I have less than uh, six seconds to talk. Um, so what, what I wanted to, I won't discuss much about uh, France because you understood exactly how it works uh, from uh, Zahedin and, and people uh, before me. Uh, you understand that the, the current uh, ecosystem and the current rules in place um, make it hard for investors to actually uh, build a fund based on crypto only. But what I will give you is the, is the, the view from BPI France. Uh, for, for the people who don't know really well uh, BPI France, we are uh, kind of a organization uh, managing public money. We are the investment uh, branch of uh, the French government. Uh, and we do basically have three uh, functions that are directly impacted by uh, ICO. The first one is the financing part. So when somebody wants to create a startup in France, he will come to us and he will get uh, some subventions, some uh, zero tax loan. Uh, and you can apply to some contest, uh, nationally speaking, to, to, to get more subvention and so on. So on this first part, well, we have basically entities in every region in France, and there, there will be a lot of different startups coming to us and saying, okay, now we are switching our bits, our business model, and we want to, to make an ICO. Can you help us fund the ICO? So this is the first way where actually we see, uh, I would say more than a couple of projects uh, every week wanting to build some ICO, and the trend is really going up. So definitely there's a strong uh, upward trend on the, on the number of ICO coming in France. The second part, uh, and uh, I'm managing uh, one of the funds on this part, uh, I'm an investment director on the seed uh, fund of uh, BPI France, which is a 15 million fund, and we see more and more people coming to us and saying uh, basically the new seed round for any blockchain project will be an ICO. So we see as well uh, some project there. And the third part, as uh, Lina mentioned, is the fund of fund. And on this one, we are in uh, quite a few uh, from in France. 
And I can tell you that many of them are trying to, to find a way to make some investment pouch, uh, definitely to try to put some, uh, some coins uh, there. We, we've seen quite a few fun interesting actually in the Telegram ICO, uh, and it's been a big topic for us. Can we allow them to go there? Uh, do we have to restrict this? Uh, so, so far I think they went for it. Um, and coming back on the, on the seed fund, uh, just to let you know, we, ha we had to actually put a new uh, clause in every, um, every uh, document that we signed when we invest in a startup regarding the ICO. So I have to be honest with you, now we're, when we do a basic seed investment in any startup, we will put a new clause saying, uh, if, you manage to, if you want to do an ICO uh, tomorrow, this will be a strategic uh, decision, and we will have to, uh, you will have to get the, the, the agreement of the board uh, on this. So I would say that overall, we, we see a huge trend coming up, uh, and we meet quite a few partners trying to build uh, some new funds on the topic. So it's a very positive upward uh, uh, trend. China is always a matter of concern for all of us because well, there's over a billion people and trillions of dollars over there. Um, uh, Twelve months ago, uh, I would say China uh, uh, had a very strong participation in the crypto market, but that's not true anymore um, for several reasons of uh, everything that has happened in the past year. So um, uh, in last July, if anything happened in, sh in China, the whole market and the whole world would suffer. But now if China decides to really ban ICOs or brand, ban crypto or whatever, it, it really doesn't change a lot. Um, the other thing that I would mention about China is that um, since the ban in the beginning of the year, all the Chinese in entrepreneurs and investors uh, start looking for opportunities elsewhere. So I, I, I was talking to someone over there that in the beginning of the year in Singapore, I was talking to a Chinese and he was asking, okay, so uh, what about in Brazil, in Mexico, and whatever um, exchanges and mining opportunities? And I said, oh yes, yeah, we have these, these and that. And he said, well, yeah, because now we have a lot of people, a lot of um, entrepreneurs in China that are looking to buy or build um, exchange, mining operations, and everything related to crypto in other countries. So they can be safer than being on China. And as of today, this has become more uh, global as it's in the whole crypto market. So we have a lot of connections between the Chinese and, and US, uh, Europe, and, and other countries. <coughs> Yeah, and um, I would also add that uh, Chinese capital is still there. It's, it's just not in China, right? And uh, our projects, which uh, we are advised, and so which go to the broad show through the China, it's still raising money. It's not through the Chinese uh, entities. It's just uh, another entities which are very broad markets of the offshore, in Asian offshore. So um, it's still uh, some money for a CEO can be raised uh, through the Chinese investors and they're still looking and they're willing to even more to invest in some investment projects. I'm going to give a very practical example. Uh, there's a US company. It's called eHarvest Hub. E -Harvest Hub. It's a very interesting blockchain project um, for putting together the, the, the uh, farmers and retailers. So they already raised funds. Uh, and they decided to raise to go to, to China to raise even more funds. So in China, officially, you cannot invest in ICO. It's illegal. But as you're saying, there are plenty of Chinese investors who want to do it. So what? How did he do it? He told me about it. He went to China, and there's he pitched his project to plenty of people, of Chinese people. But there's one word that cannot be said, that cannot be uh, pronounced. The thing that cannot be named. ICO, token. You don't pronounce this word, but everyone understands. Everyone understands what you're talking about. If you pronounce it, you're going to almost all go to jail. So they understand perfectly. And then, in the private dinner, in the evening, privately, you discuss real things. So he's going to seduce the investors without pronouncing the word ICO, 
And then in private, the nurse is going to, 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 to tell the truth, so to, to speak more freely. And then, as you're saying, oh, the, these Chinese investors have a, sub have a subsidiary in Singapore or somewhere, and they do the deal. Indeed, there are plenty of money in China who, are, who want to, to get in, uh, to get into the crypto. Just one quick word. Um, I really, um, I used to work for Amazon, so I really um, like to believe in data at some point. And uh, when I spoke to a few very top tier one VC fund, uh, crypto fund investing uh, in very early in the top main ICO project in the world. And they gave me this, uh, this piece of data where they're saying that 75% of the, of the money in, a, in the current big ICO are coming from Asia overall. 15% um, is coming from uh, Middle East, 7% from US and 4% from Europe right now. So it's, it's not actually always coming from directly vehicles based in those countries, but the people behind it and the money, the real source of money, uh, is uh, split in this way. Thank you. And when the China ban happened, uh, a lot of money moved to Japanese exchanges, and we, we, we could see a spike in fiat to crypto in Japanese exchanges because of that. Let's listen to Jacopo about Italy. Um, are there many crypto investors in Italy? Um, I mean, personally, I think that uh, in blockchain and um, especially in Europe, it doesn't make much sense to talk about countries and nations. I think it makes much more sense to talk about nationalities, maybe. Uh, like, I mean, in France, we have examples of projects being developed on cryptocurrency and blockchain, um, but they're not always doing them, uh, I mean, the majority of the cases are not doing them in France. Uh, I think uh, this is a common thing for the whole Europe, uh, apart from uh, Switzerland, Gibraltar, Malta, and Luxembourg maybe. Um, in other countries, there are not big projects. So, I mean, in Italy, um, there are some projects, uh, but the big ones are happening outside of Italy, mainly made by Italians. And um, I don't know if um, any, I mean, it's, I guess many of you here have heard about the uh, recent elections in Italy and all the trouble that has been there at one point, or there's been a crisis, so it's coalition government, uh, mainly by, uh, I'm not going to politics, but I think it's, it's great to have some context. Um, uh, there's like a right uh, party and a populist one. The populist one has been since the beginning uh, talking a lot about blockchain. and. Um, when they decided to do a coalition of government, uh, they had proposed as the economics uh, minister, Paolo Savona. Um, the president of the republic decided not to accept him as a uh, minister of the economy because he had anti-USB. Um, so he then had to be moved as a European affairs ministry. But what is interesting, and what has been doing a lot of trends in Italy during that moment, is that Paolo Savona was the chairman of Euclid. Euclid, uh, I guess maybe some of you know, it's um, an algo trading platform for blockchain, very algo trading platform for blockchain, uh, made by an Italian, Antonio Simeone, um, which is based in London essentially, but uh, they're applying artificial intelligence to a crypto fund. Um, plus, we have many other projects dealing with uh, uh, blockchain, the Edu wallet team is fully Italian, 100% Italian, but they're based in Switzerland. Uh, so, I mean, basically the community, the Italian community is very active, um, it's very proactive, it's doing a lot, it's innovating a lot in blockchain. Uh, they're not always doing that in, uh, in Italy, but I'm pretty optimistic because the legislation, uh, especially from a tax point perspective, is not that bad as yet uh, in Italy for the moment. Um, and maybe the current government will be with us. Thank you, Jacopo. Thank you. Um, Paul, would you like to tell us a few words about uh, France complementing the, the information that Olivier already uh, provided, the general information? Perhaps you can tell us more precisely about your initiative. Present yourself. Few words. Hello, I'm Paul Bonneau. Originally, I founded Largeur Finance, uh, uh, M&A boutique where I'm doing fundraising. And, uh, traditional MA in the mainstream business, uh, mainstream finance, and uh, we have uh, launched an uh, ICO boutique uh, dedicated to corporate investment uh, for European and US companies launching their ICO. Uh, the name is Psyon, Psyon.finance. Uh, it will be launched with this name in a few days. 
and uh, we have worked for with, with another team for the last 12 months uh, launching an investment vehicle dedicated to crypto assets and companies related to the blockchain. Um, we started from a, a white paper, uh, and, uh, not a white paper from ICO, but uh, from a large white paper with uh, only uh, to think what would be the best vehicle uh, in terms of interest uh, for investors uh, to invest in the blockchain industry and in crypto assets. Um, we have made our shopping all over, the, the, all over Europe uh, because we wanted to be settled in Europe. And uh, what we have found is that it's not possible to do that in France, except in a club deal. Uh, but you, you pay corporate tax on your uh, uh, added value and things like that, and, it's, and you cannot be regulated. Uh, then we have uh, launched uh, three weeks ago an asset manager uh, based in Luxembourg, uh, not regulated because it's not possible to be regulated. There is no um, uh, regulator in Europe giving you the risk assessment for an IEFMD uh, vehicle uh, because regulators are not ready to do that if you are uh, if you have in your assets uh, crypto assets I mean if you have tokens and when you want to invest in token the only possibility is to be not, not under supervision but to be registered in uh, Luxembourg and uh, we launched uh, on Monday our uh, vehicle able to invest in uh, private equity because we do think that private equity indeed is interesting uh, to invest in equity in companies and the blockchain is very good because uh, the tools are uh, now uh, are setting up now and uh, we invest in tokens as well which is uh, quite unique and um, uh, we will uh, launch our press release next week and uh, we are able to collect uh, fiat money and as well um, uh, Bitcoin and Ether, which is quite uh, unique in the world. But what I would say to, to, to give you a, a present answer is that uh, it's very hard to uh, be uh, regulated. And in Europe, uh, the problem is a problem of ecosystem and providers of services uh, to the fund and to the asset management. Uh, for example, you don't have any uh, custodian agent able to give you uh, the custody of your assets if you have tokens in your, uh, in your assets in Europe. Just one quick word on this. Uh, if you're planning on launching an ICO tomorrow and you, you want to get some fund uh, to actually prepare the ICO and the natural project and, and everything, and you're planning to get a, a VC crypto fund into your, into your, uh, your ICO, I suggest strongly that you actually follow this advice and, uh, and get the, the fund actually both in equity and on the token side, it really changed the dynamic of your relationship with the fund. If you're basically only getting a fund that will come and buy crypto and sell the crypto a few months later after the ICO launch, you're only in a speculative way, a short-term way, and even if you put some lockup, the day after the lockup ends, they will basically sell their position. What they want to do is just, uh, it's not a Ponzi scheme, but close to it. Um, but if you, if you take a partner that will also be on the equity side, you're, you're on different uh, forces here and you're working on the long term with them. And it's interesting. They, they will not uh, instantly sell all the position of the, the coin at some point because they really believe in your project long term because they are linked to it. They will bring more people and more forces into the project, not only on the short few months of the ACO, but throughout the years. So this is a huge difference uh, in, the, in the fund you want to work with, I think. Thank you, Olivier. That, that's a very important point because a lot of people uh, mix company and the network and for most of the projects the network is a completely separate entity so when you're buying a token in a uh, JT token one of those that uh, we saw on the slides before you actually are buying a piece of the ecosystem and the network or the network not the company so, um, one of the questions we always ask for, for uh, people that present in ICO project is, okay, but what's the relationship between your company and the network? How are you going to make money? Because of the, the, if you have a network that may grow a lot, 
but if the token economics and the company relationship with the network is not clear, it's not well designed, you can go to the grip. Thank you. Are we really have time, I'm sorry, so 10 seconds. Because 10 seconds, you have very little Okay, time. I mean, just, if, just a quick suggestion. If you ever want to launch your SEO, actually agree with them. Uh, it's better not to pay your advisors, like your lawyers, accountants, or whatever, in tokens. It's better to pay them uh, with uh, equity stakes, or maybe if, if you don't really want to give out your equity, then maybe at least give them fiat, because as soon as your token is going to get listed, as they don't really care about having your token, they will sell, and your token will really risk to crash. And we have seen this several times. Thank you. He, he, here is where security tokens occur. Not utility, but security. Thank you. Stay a little bit. I'm going to uh, invite to the stage uh, Daniele. Daniele is a representative of Truffle Capital. This is a, he's going. This is an example of a traditional venture fund who is now turning crypto in a certain way. So he's he's going to explain to us how what, what they are doing this year. Daniele. Thanks for having us. Um, quick background on Truffle Capital. Uh, First of all, we got a question a few, few times. We do not invest in food, not truffle. Uh, truffle is a venture capital company. It's been in business for 20 years now. Uh, based in Paris, historically investing in two main areas, IT and digital as a whole, and life science and tech. Uh, the, the IT and digital sector has been uh, focusing more and more since the last four years uh, towards FinTech and InsurTech, right? And that's how we, we, we got closer and closer to blockchain and then uh, cryptos and ICO. Um, couple of figures, 900 million under management, six investment, uh, 14 exit, 15 IPOs, or the other round. I will call the right number between the IPOs and the exit. Um, at the moment, why, why we're here, uh, Truffle launched uh, Incubator three years and a half ago, dedicated to uh, FinTech and InsurTech. Nine companies created, uh, three exited. Uh, one is Credit Point Flat, uh, that some, some of you may know. Um, so in, in terms of ratio, uh, the thing went like, uh -huh, something to do in FinTech and Insure Tech. Uh, so we took a strong position, um, and we just uh, closed the first, uh, the first uh, we just had the first closure of our fund dedicated to FinTech and Insure Tech. 70 million fund at disclosure, we are now 100 million, uh, targeting 150 uh, um, for the second closure. So what's our point? We, we like, we are traditional venture capital uh, investors, uh, but since the, uh, the company was uh, founded by two entrepreneurs, that's this fiber, this entrepreneur fiber has been always there. So what we also do, in case we, we, we find a nice use case, uh, partnership with our investor and, and with university, and we think there's some value in a specific area, we might also want to create the company. This position us really early stage in the life, size, uh, in the life cycle of, of the companies we are invested in. So how do we, uh, while we're here, first investment we, we, we did in our fund is called Monitor. It's a direct payment platform, uh, blockchain based, and we are actually now, uh, together with the uh, management of the company, uh, rolling out our ICO. So what, what, what's the point here? Um, for traditional investors, uh, there's a lot of question about could ICO replace venture capital uh, as, an, as an industry? Uh, we think, given the fact that you can actually do an ICO really early stage, or really late stage, we saw Telegram uh, recently, uh, the idea is, our position is for, for the venture capital, especially if you, if you enter in the company really early, ICO could be uh, a really nice way to, to bring value to the company, helping financing the company uh, without, without actually impacting uh, the cap table. We think that the role of the venture has the old management uh, should be uh, really hands on, also on this part. And that's why we are actually going through this uh, super exciting uh, adventure. There's a, lot, there's a lot to learn, honestly, uh, from, from all the parties uh, involved, uh, from the regulation, as we started this morning, to the actual companies and venture as well. Uh, and that's why we think it's, it's going to be really, uh, really great. Getting to cryptos, um, we do not invest in cryptos now. We want to finalize our, our investment, our fund before. 
but the, the, the future looks pretty, uh, pretty interesting on that side as well. Thank you very much, uh, Daniele. Um, uh, I would like, uh, no, perhaps uh, I would like to invest, uh, to invest. <laughs> I would like to invest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I would like to invest in Monetrack. Is this the name of the company you were mentioning? Right. Yes, so I would like to invest. That's my business card. <laughs> 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 uh, very nice. So uh, I would like to invite Jean David Benichou uh, on stage. Thank you, uh, sirs. Uh, so my name is Jean-David Benichou. I am a French entrepreneur. I've been uh, an entrepreneur for 30 years, mostly in the field of electronic communication. I founded, co-founded over 15 companies, and some of them expanded in over 10 countries. So uh, my background is telecommunication. Uh, my first investment in crypto was back in 2013. This is when I bought bitcoins. At that time, they were below uh, hundred dollars. They were exactly seven, seventy dollars. And I started to look actively at ICOs uh, two years ago. I became a business angel five years ago, and I have many friends of mine, uh, entrepreneurs like me, uh, that created companies, made exit, and that also wanted to invest into ICOs. So if you want, I can share with you uh, what has been the journey into the ICO jungle and how difficult it is for a business angel uh, to really get it. Thank you. So the first point is that as entrepreneur, what we are doing is that we are investing into private companies. We are buying shares because we believe that the private ownership will translate into a rising value. But when we are going to ICOs, this is totally different. We are not buying shares, we are buying tokens. And tokens is totally different of, it's a totally different way of private ownership. Basically, what does a token? It commoditizes the goodwill. Instead of uh, generating wealth for shareholders, it's spreading, it's spreading this wealth among the community of token users. So the first point, which is very uh, cumbersome when you have a business angel and you want to invest into those companies, is what is the ecosystem, what is the tokenomics. And the, the, the most uh, difficult point is when you see companies that are coming to you to raise money, selling shares, and six months after they are coming to you for an ICO to sell tokens. This is very difficult. Um, we as uh, business angels, we don't care a lot about regulation. We are not regulated funds as the uh, people that were sitting here. Usually we invest our own money, uh, we are fast decision maker, and what we want is uh, going to a new venture where we think and we believe there will be a creation of value. So uh, to navigate the ICO uh, panorama, the first thing we need is to get a sense that it's a native decentralized project and that the token is not here only to raise money but it is here because it will generate an ecosystem well so uh, it, what are the concrete uh, cases you had you are an advisor to some of these uh, do you feel that they, they who, who among business angels are ready to to listen to such ideas and to consider investing as is it a lot of people in France or just very few for the moment do you think it will evolve so I'm also the president of an organization which is called the Cryptocurrency Club, and this is where we met with Valentin. Uh, is anybody here from BTU Protocol? Hey, Vidal, good to see you. So yes, I'm an advisor in uh, BTU Protocol, um, which is very successful, and which is a truly native uh, token with, uh, uh, by DNA, it, it, it's decentralized. Do we have anybody from Ariane? Yes, we do. Hey, good to see you. So uh, I'm also involved in Ariane, uh, and I've... They're going to speak on stage. What about the business angels? What do French business angels, do they like or not ICO? What is your experience? You know, they are very curious about ICOs, and they are willing to go. And, you know, for Betty, for example, I took with me almost seven business angels that were interested, that called me saying, do you think it's, I should do it? And, you know, as always, I said, if you have an allocation of money that you can lose in full, so go for it, because we might have a, a great price. If not, just stay away from it. I see. I would 
also like to share a bit of my experience. We have uh, discussed with uh, several business angel associations uh, uh, in France, like uh, Investisor, for example, or Angel Square. And uh, what they said, what they told us is, um, uh, yes, uh, there is a, a minority, a very tight minority who understand what, what crypto is about, what ICOs are about. They are curious. Uh, there's certainly a need for, for some uh, education. Uh, and uh, probably with time it will develop. But for the moment, it's, it's, it's a very, very tiny minority of French business angels coming there. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, uh, um, uh, from the. Do you, do you know La Maison du Bitcoin? Uh, everyone, every French people now even have this coin house. It, yeah, it has changed to house. coin house. Yes, coin house. Uh, so, uh, we have a representative of coin house who is going to come here. And to tell us about uh, another another type of investors uh, also uh, coming to crypto or not coming to crypto, um, uh, CoinHouse for the foreign uh, the foreign players you might not know it yet, but it's one of the most established organizations in France uh, for uh, in the field of, on the crypto scene. So please come in. So thank you. So I am Stephen Maraj. I am the uh, So basically, CoinHouse, uh, based in Paris, is currently employing more than 25 employees. Two types of profile, people coming from the crypto community and people like myself coming from the financial industry and mainly from the DC industry. And our aim is to bridge the gap between those two communities. So basically, uh, we deliver three types of services, training, brokerage, and customer. As far as the family offices are concerned, so we see more and more interest. I mean, it makes sense when you are multi-asset class to invest in a new decorated asset class, so they may, it makes sense to them. So I can foresee two types of family offices, the regulated one and the not regulated one. So for the regulated one, it's a little bit worry. Uh, let's say they're struggling with two things, with the lack of regulation, and uh, with the lack, there is no proper custody solutions. On those two aspects, uh, CoinNow is very active. We are currently working with the IMF to set up new standards in terms of compliance, in terms of KYC, in terms of AML. And we are discussing with IMF to become the first uh, crypto broker regulated and uh, to become as well the first crypto custody regulated. I mean, we on board, we are a spin-off of Ledger, and so we know very well Ledger, and we on board did the Vault solution, which is the P2P storage solution, which was announced by Ledger at the consensus conference in June, and uh, we are the only one in France to deploy this solution. So we've got now going forward a solution to custody of the funds and to attract, you know, the big players and the regulated players. As far as the non-regulated are concerned, so basically, these are the ones who are starting to invest. So it always starts, and there are more and more talking at our door, it's always starting with training, with explaining things. And we've got a deep expert in doing so, and we can see now that they are starting to invest a few bitcoins, starting slowly, slowly, to experiment on the market. Well, so, uh uh, let's hope it's the start, and uh, there will be more and more. But as we saw in the beginning, uh, there are still some obstacles in the one in France. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask Maxime uh, Rousseau uh, to join us, because he is another class of investor. He represents a class of investor. Look. Uh, I met Maxime at our last conference, two months ago. Uh, and he took, he's a student from one of the largest French uh, economics university, uh, Dauphine. Uh, and you told me that in reality you're not only a student, but a super, super active investor. So, you, you, it seems you're a seer of investor. So how did, you, how did you get acquainted with this crypto investment world, and what, what, do, you, what do you do in it? What, what, what do you invest in, and what's your activity? Okay, so hi, Paul. Um, thanks to, to come here. So I'm Maxime Rousseau, I'm 19, and I'm a French student of the Dauphine University. 
and from about one year and a half, I'm interested in blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And since about maybe one a year, I invest in cryptocurrencies and mostly in ICOs. So today I, in, I invest about in 10 ICOs, so with small amounts, but I'm doing also asset management with my family, so it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay for my, for my age. Um, yeah, I invested a lot of ICOs and it's quite technical because you need to learn a lot about white papers, how to find a good ICO, uh, what is a good ICO, what is a bad ICO, how to see it, how to understand it. So I discovered uh, cryptocurrencies with some friends. So we are discussing a lot and looking a lot, so doing some research. What is um, what is it? The team is the team good? Is the team professional? Is the project current? And with all of this, um, we I invest in several ICOs, and in six six months, uh, the last six months I did yeah one hundred percent benefits. So with the crash, um, for since um, January, it's not so bad, and yeah, I'm quite an, maybe not a serial ICO investor, but a good one, I think. So, uh, so far, uh, did you earn a lot of money? Uh, did you have been the crack uh, recently? Uh, what, what about your return on investment? Yeah. So, I know it's not easy, but I did, I'm doing a safe uh, management of my crypto assets, and I know it's not easy um, in the cryptocurrency world because it's we see every day some crypto that increase of 200% in a day or in an hour or decrease of 80% so it's very crazy but I need, I, I stay you know focused and when an ACO uh, after being listed on an exchange take maybe 200 or 300% I'm selling a part of my bag you know maybe 50 or 60% of my bag to take a profit to be sure of what I, to have some money back uh, and the rest of my bag, I keep it for long-term investment. And no matter if the project failed and or succeeds, I will have some profit. And that's why I I did some profit. And with even with the crack, and yeah, today I'm about 100% return on investment. 100%. Yes. How many? In which period of time? In about the last six months. Well, this is not 3,000% like the Brazilian fund, but this is 100% in six months. Well, I think we're going to applaud. Uh, do you offer, uh, are you an advisor or want to give lessons or things like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for other people than your family? Yeah, yeah, for, for about maybe one month, two months, I'm giving some lessons in cryptocurrencies for people. So because I'm giving some lessons for students, basically for five years, so I like to, to help the authors. So yeah, I, I like to give some lessons and why not become an advisor of an ICO? So if you want to, to have my okay, advice. So, so you can call Maxim if you need his services. Thank you very much for, for your uh, <coughs> for exchange. And so yeah, we have an amazing panel of people who work for exchange, uh, investment banks, and the like. And the idea is to give you an overview of the market today. Um, I'd like to start with Anton. Anton is a VP at Matrix Bank in, in, in Russia. Um, they do investment as well as advisory for crypto projects. So Anton, can you tell us a bit about the landscape for tokens today, please? Yeah, so uh, today on the descending market, on the whole market, uh, we have um, like now one, one trend. We analyzed about uh, 1,500 ICOs for, for, for a year. And uh, some, sometimes we see like very marvelous, uh, very complex utilities economics. And really, it's not realistic. It's not gonna work for some time. And um, our uh, view that trend of the 2018 it's like security tokens it's the token which stores some ownership it's much much easier comparing to uh, utility token it's just a um, very obvious idea that equity lies behind the token or revenue share or dividends 
it doesn't matter. But uh, there are a lot of advantages uh, comparing to classic venture schemes, of course, in terms of liquidity, in terms of like uh, compliance, in terms of uh, uh, asset lending to from one person to another. But the problem is there is no exchanges, there is no platforms for uh, for security tokens. And here is just for your information some kind of landscape of security tokens. And by the end of the uh, 2018, uh, several major uh, Platforms such as Polymath, such as Black Moon, they will launch. Uh, they will uh, provide their ecosystem for companies that can do security token offering. And of course, the exchanges, the one of the major ones, Gibraltar uh, Exchange, T0, American US uh, Security Exchange, uh, they will uh, launch and provide the new bread to the whole market in terms of security. Of course, utilities will be, but uh, the next thing you'll hear. From our point of view, is of course the security of the So you, you speak about a shift from uh, utility to security tokens, so that raises many questions about exchanges. So how about you, William? You, you're in the exchange business um, at Gatecoin. Can you tell us a bit more about that? And perhaps can you also inform us about that shift uh, to security tokens, please? Definitely. So to give you a Overview. So, uh, Gitcoin is a cryptocurrency trading platform uh, based in Hong Kong. Uh, we have uh, 50 employees in Hong Kong. We are money service oracle licensed in Hong Kong, and we enable people to buy and sell uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and recently uh, Tezos tokens uh, and uh, 40 other uh, cryptocurrency tokens. People can buy and sell them with HKD, USD, and other. So um, what we have observed uh, recently is that um, people are, like cryptocurrency investors are less and less interested in uh, utility tokens uh, because um, <coughs> basically uh, utility tokens, they, uh, interestingly, they don't have a real, I mean, like they, they don't have a clear value. Um, because uh, if you are using a token to access to a network, basically you are buying it, and then you are, you are using it to access to the network, but there's no incentive to keep, to hold uh, the token. So, um, so of course it impacts negatively on the price of the token and the, uh, uh, the volumes uh, on, on the trading part. Um, so yes, uh, it is expected to have more and more security tokens uh, in the future, uh, especially like that there is a regulatory framework coming for uh, security tokens, but also uh, security exchanges, security token exchanges, um, and it's uh, definitely a, a trend. Um, uh, then. Uh, Regarding the, the overall ICO market, uh, what we have noticed is that um, after the ICO craze that we have experienced last year, uh, the market is getting more and more uh, rational uh, and the market is maturing. Uh, cryptocurrency investors are more demanding uh, regarding the technology, the tokenomics, uh, regarding uh, the value of a given token for, uh, for investors, uh, and um, and basically, uh, uh, for, for the new ICOs, uh, a lot of effort has been made in order to uh, prove and to, to give more uh, insights regarding uh, the future uh, value of the token. Okay, yeah, so I guess you, you, you told us about the platform on which uh, exchanges take place and uh, the shift from security to from utility to security tokens, and also how the market is becoming more, say, rational, as you said. Um, one thing I would have liked to know is, um, how is market making taking place on these exchanges? Uh, Zaidin, can you tell us about that, please? Yes, so maybe I could uh, introduce um, what is the market making. So. Um, and who I am, so I'm the co-founder and the trading at Wu-Tang. 
which is a market maker and OTC desk for large uh, volumes of cryptocurrencies. Um, on the market making side, the business of a market maker for non-financial experts is to um, buy and sell uh, all the time on the market. So anytime, uh, if anyone comes to an exchange that will do market making on, on a certain token, he will be able to buy from us or to sell from us. And when he buys from us and someone else sells to us, we will take the spread, the difference. So the, the goal of the market making is to bring liquidity without impacting the price, otherwise it's market manipulation. Um, and uh, this, uh, this we have the risk of the market, so we need to not lose money on the token itself and take only the spread or the fees or the rebate fees that some exchanges might give us for this job of bringing liquidity. It's just the same as in Eurex or Euronext, but on, a new, uh, on new exchanges and on a new uh, securities or assets, to be more general. Cool. So the things that, which I don't know and I'm not sure everyone knows, it's like, well, first of all, we hear sometimes about OTC. OTC is a bit different from regular market making, I would say. Um, but you can tell us more about that. So that would be my first question. Can you explain us how an OTC trade takes place? And uh, a second question is, so we've heard about exchange, we've heard about market making. Um, what's the proportion of OTC trades compared to regular market making today? And do you see that proportion changing in any way? Can you tell us about that, please? Um, yes. So, um, at, at a certain time, uh, a few months ago, the, 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 we, we, we've seen a larger uh, volumes on, on exchanges. Uh, recently, the, this proportion is more... Uh, it's, it's it's, it's very difficult to, to quantify those things because you are not uh, you do not have the information of all the other competitors. Uh, but what we roughly uh, estimate is 50-50 on exchanges and 50% on exchanges and 50% off exchanges. So what is an OTC trade? An OTC trade is an over-the-counter uh, trade that does not uh, um, happen on exchanges. And uh, the way it works is uh, quite simple. There is an OTC desk, for example, we are an OTC desk. The client that we onboarded um, asks for a price, so it's a request for quote, the first step. <coughs> then we price, one of our traders will price uh, on the chat, on voice, or uh, electronically for some, uh, some, 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 market, some OTC desks. Then um, the, the client validate the price, for example, it says done, and then the price is done. And we will need to deliver, or he will need to deliver, and we will need to send funds, or he will need to send funds. Um, then the, so it's the, the execution, and then he will receive a, a confirmation of, of trade. It's, it's just it's very similar to uh, what we see on the financial markets, uh, on illiquid uh, markets, for example, swap markets. That's the way it works. Um, so <coughs> that, that's pretty it. Uh, the, the, just for, for, for the, the, the clients of those best of those desks are private banks, uh, family offices, investment funds. Um, Ultra high net worth people that have uh, 200 million uh, euros that they want to invest or even more and they want to buy every day 10 million of Bitcoin or whatever or sell. And more recently, we have opened to, uh, to ICOs uh, that are willing to cash out. So they want to, to sell their, their, their Bitcoin or Bitters. So we will, we will buy uh, those, uh, those blocks of uh, cryptocurrencies and s send them the, the euros or U US dollars they, they are willing to. Cool, and if I were to end on a question uh, to William. William, some people speak now about distributed exchange rather than centralized exchange. Um, so there are these two types of exchange. Uh, blockchain is supposed to be decentralized. On the other hand, most exchanges of today are centralized. Most, traded volume, most of the volume traded takes place on decentralized exchange. So some people speak about Decentralizing exchanges. Uh, William, you are an exchange expert. Why don't you tell us about that, please? <coughs> Thank you. So, uh, decentralized exchanges are extremely uh, uh, interesting and have the potential to uh, disrupt uh, cryptocurrency trading um, for uh, crypto to crypto markets. So, uh, that just uh, to give you a bit of an overview. Uh, about the differences between exchanges. So there are uh, two types of exchanges. 
uh, exchanges that enable you to uh, trade cryptocurrencies only, like a Bitcoin to Litecoin or a Bitcoin to Ethereum. Um, and you have uh, crypto to fiat exchanges. Uh, those exchanges are uh, the entry point to cryptocurrency. So uh, basically, if you want to buy, uh, if you don't have any cryptocurrency and you want to buy uh, some tokens, then uh, you need to deposit euro to, um, to a centralized exchange and then uh, buy Bitcoin and Ethereum and then uh, move the coins to another uh, exchange, uh, crypto exchange. And, um, and actually, uh, decentralized exchanges, they will disrupt the crypto to crypto exchanges. So uh, basically, instead of uh, once when, once you buy a Bitcoin or Ethereum, instead of uh, relying on another centralized exchange, a crypto to crypto exchange, you will actually use a uh, decentralized exchange. There are some uh, decentralized exchanges on the market right now. Uh, they they don't have a lot of liquidity, but it's very likely that the like the solution will improve in the future. Um, however, regarding crypto fiat markets. Uh, it's very fun. Like there is no way actually uh, you can um, you can you can have you can decentralize this because at some point you need a client bank account uh, and basically like so you need the central point uh, to, to access uh, to uh, like a to, to credit the funds and things like that. So um, so I, I would say um, uh, for us uh, as a as a crypto to fiat exchange. It's not a threat, it's actually like something that, that will improve the whole ecosystem. However, for crypto crypto exchanges, it, it is a threat. Cool. So if I understood correctly, you can decentralize exchange for token to token trading, but it's harder for currency uh, fiat to token tra uh, conversion, for example. And indeed you need a bank, uh, you need KYC and so on, and that's very hard to implement on a distributed platform. Anyways, we, we are done now, but if you have a couple of questions, I think uh, we are happy to answer. Please. A good decentralized exchange. Mm. The thing is, there are very few today, right? There is only, it's not yet quite ready. Isis for the for the depending on blockchain, there are some on a stellar, right? For for stellar tokens. So there will be more and more. You just uh, we also have our own exchange and uh, uh, on the Ethereum. Just go to CoinMarketCap and grab the first. It, it will be Isis. Well, uh, to answer your question, uh, this is one of the best, perhaps the best. You will judge. You will ask every question after the event. This is Alexei Koloskov. He's the chief architect of Waze Decentralized Exchange. The great Russian guy who came specially from Moscow, as well as Tom came from St. Petersburg. Uh, he, we heard him yesterday in the meetup. He is a very, very deep and strong tech. He's going to present in a few minutes his project, uh, Whole Vest, but he's also the creator, or one of the creators of the Waze Decentralized Exchange. So if this subject is interesting to you, I'm sure just after, during the lunch, he will tell you everything about decentralized your exchanges and his own project for this. So this is Alexei from, from Moscow, who came here, especially to see you and to meet you. Oh, well, uh, is there any other question? <coughs> okay, so uh, we promised that we're going to show you some Merci beaucoup, chers amis. Thank you so much. Merci pour votre Thank you, Samuel, for this, for this, uh, for this discussion. Um, and uh, so now we, uh, as promised, we're going to show you uh, some top French, Swiss, and Russian blockchain projects. So I would like all the teams of this project to come here next to the to the to the uh, to the stage, not on the stage yet, but to get to get ready to get on stage when you will when you will present your own project. So this blockchain show will be presented by 
Michael Nicolson, Jonathan Béran. Hi. Uh, well, I think a little bit of English uh, in general, because we have international investors. But uh, well, some of some of you uh, will will pitch in French, but generally speaking, that is the English. Who wants the presentation in English? Okay, let's do it in English. I'm sorry, the text will be in French for some slides. Uh, okay. Uh, I will present what I do after the blockchain masterclass. It's not the subject yet. Uh -huh. Just a second. Cool, I get the focus. Okay, who invested in cryptocurrencies? Okay, when we invest in cryptocurrency, we say, okay, you know what? I'd be rich because this thing made something like multiplied by 500 in few years. No? So we think we're going to make a huge make it rain. But behind this, we have to understand that blockchain is bigger than cryptocurrency. Blockchain is a description that will touch a lot, a lot, a lot of industries. Everything. I think it will be bigger than internet as a revolution. Who agree with that? Okay, the other is because you have to study and understand it. I'm sure of it. Not as big, but bigger. Bigger. Really? You're right. Oh so, now we have uh, to welcome some entrepreneurs that with their blockchain project want to disrupt the world, want to change something, want to improve something. So we will have some entrepreneurs uh, and then we have a time to pitch. The first one is Ariane. My dear friend, you have the video and you are including the video five minutes, no more. Julien, right here with his black shirt, will put you the timer and show you the timer. So, you want this? Or you want me to launch the video? Just launch the video here first. In today's world, how do you know you're buying a genuine product? At Ariane, we are building the first luxury protocol where all genuine products and objects of value will be recorded. Backed by blockchain, these anonymous records are impossible to destroy, forge, or breach and capture a lifetime of product information. Most prestigious products come with a serial number and or advanced technology identification like NFC. For example, let's imagine you acquire a watch. As a new owner, you can register your product in our app, an easy-to-use online repository with decentralized, independent verification. The watch will automatically be registered with Ariane, and if it's not already pre-registered by the brand, a second-hand marketplace specialist or the brand itself will be able to verify the item and certify its authenticity easily and smoothly. This certification does not expire over time and is transferable for upcoming product transactions. Moreover, this initiates an exclusive communication channel that lasts throughout a product's life cycle and allows owners and brands to stay in touch with each other. Ariane enables an autonomous community where you will be able to buy and sell an item confident of its authenticity and its history in a totally secure environment. Owners are now in full control of their data. They choose which data to share, when, and with whom. And nowadays, this is true luxury. Ariane, welcome to the ownership revolution. All right, so I guess this uh, explains quite well the train web problem we're trying to solve uh, with the uh, blockchain. One of the big questions that we're asked um, when we say we're a blockchain project is like, what real problem do you actually solve? And so here, really creating a, a passport for your product that would follow an owner over and over again uh, as the product is resold or just uh, when it's gifted is something that solves the problem both for owners and for brands. Because for brands, one of their main issues is how do I actually stay in touch with the current owner of a project, of a uh, product. Uh, so 
to build this, um, today, I mean, blockchain actually uh, is, is, is uh, nascent, and I'm convinced, like your master of ceremony has said, that it's going to become a, a major revolution uh, for all of us. But you, uh, today, to build those things, you need a team that actually has experience, uh, and it's usually something that's lacking in, uh, in such projects. Uh, on Ariane, though, as soon as the slides. <laughs> You don't have my size. All right. Well, if you don't have size, we we've actually managed to get a, a team of uh, of uh, really experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, since we're in French, it's probably a bit of a bit collective. Uh, we've managed to uh, two of the, the former co-founders have uh, left uh, uh, exited this collective last year, and uh, they actually we actually got them out of their holiday, uh, and uh, they are now they joined the founding team, uh, which is really useful for their exp exp uh, their expertise on the second hand market. Uh, side, we also uh, managed to get uh, Gilles Romanetto and uh, Fred Montagnon, who, have, uh, who are really experienced entrepreneurs in uh, the ad tech side uh, and uh, have been launching for the last four years. Uh, and then we also have a deep expertise in uh, the luxury industry. Uh, we have Emmanuel, who was at Omega, Jean Marc Belaïch, who was uh, the an SVP at, uh, at Tiffany's. Uh, and uh, Gregory Qui, who's uh, an expert in digitization of the luxury industry. Um, but of course, so, so we can build this, uh, this platform, um, but of course, um, building it is, is not sufficient. You also need partnerships. And uh, we have already have three pilot projects uh, with uh, Balenciaga for shoes, the Karen Group, uh, with uh, Vachon Constantin from, uh, from the Richemont Group, which is the largest uh, uh, group in, um, in watches. Uh, and with the uh, ONC for, for an application that's slightly different um, with, with champagne bottles. Uh, and uh, of course, we also have some partnerships with, uh, with an extended third party ecosystem. Uh, so with uh, Christie, Christie's and, and AXA uh, Insurance, because really creating this passport of a product not only allows to solve problems for brands and for customers, it also solve, uh, allows to unleash a lot of value on how do you easily uh, prove that you have a product and uh, that uh, you, to, when you want to get it insured, uh, or when you lose a product and you get it um, and you you uh, get reimbursed by your insurance, you um, the, the insurance you put a hold on the on the actual token, the, the passport of your product. Um, so I have 30 seconds, so you're remiss if I don't talk about uh, the fact that we will have an ICO. We haven't launched the ICO yet. Right now we're still in round zero. Uh, which is open for angels and uh, funds. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it. Thank you. When I met uh, Fred Montagnon in New York, yeah. he was uh, really enjoying your project and full of energy when he was talking about it. Yeah. Thank you very much and wish you a lot of success. Okay, the next project. He's a uh, French Italian at the ICO. Uh, please welcome, if you don't know him, it's a great guy with a lot of knowledge. Please welcome Vidal Shriki for the Betterie Protocol. Have you already booked online a hotel room, a restaurant, or a show? Each time, the internet platforms are taking advantage of their monopolies to overcharge you. BTU disrupts the current system. BTU enables everyone to create independent booking platforms. We use public blockchain to list availabilities of services like hotels and many others. We offer free software to view this data and to book online. It's trust in the decentralized booking economy and allows a fairer compensation for everyone. More companies can enter the booking industry. In this new innovative world, competition is healthier and you are the winners. Discover BTU on btu-protocol.com. So we analyze the booking industry, and we realize that it's a very huge market. It's about five trillion dollars to manage the reservation of hotel, restaurants, and medical appointments, and even B2B stocks between companies. And to handle this five trillion dollar industry, 
online booking platform are collecting almost one trillion dollars. So this is a huge value that uh, can be captured by those platforms just because there is no peer-to-peer -peer reservation system. And that is why we invented the BTU, the Booking Token Unit Protocol, that uh, allows uh, real peer-to-peer -peer reservation. And why it's important is because this token economy can capture this one trillion dollar value and redistribute it to the market participants, being the users, the developers who are building new uh, booking systems, and the uh, service providers like hotels, restaurants, and the rest. And what is the business model, what we call the token economics uh, behind uh, BT? Yes. So the, uh, the role of our token is to, 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 to serve as a guarantee uh, for, for the service providers to confirm the reservations and also to incentivize uh, developers to build to be the gateways to this peer-to-peer -peer reservation system for end users who do not know how to manipulate the tokens. And uh, what happens is that the more the system is used, the more uh, bookings are opened, so the more token is at stake because uh, it's the, the token is used to guarantee bookings and you always book in advance. So the more the system is used, the more token is blocked at stake and it creates a scarcity in the market Whereas you still uh, have the demand that is rising because you need to pay commissions to the developers and to open a lot of new uh, reservations. So the token economics is favorable to the first buyers and that's important because the, uh, we as a company are keeping um, a, 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 a reserve that is meant to give a sustainability to the system and continue to be able to fund uh, our ecosystem. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, when the public token site is start, the public token site. Um, um, uh, we stay tuned. We have a lot of announcements. Come on, the, on our website, register to the newsletter. Uh, we have a very vibrant community. Um, most of our, our, of our token buyers are uh, professionals, are software companies that explore the usage of our protocol. We have, for instance, a kind of lonely planet in France who have bought our token. Why? Because there is a real uh, uh, business model to use our token. When those people use our token, they become a kind of, if, if, it's, if it's in the hotel industry, they take all the full market share of the big platforms on their own audience. If, uh, with our system, if you are making the recommendation for reservation, you're the one who is being rewarded for this. And it's not going, the money is not going to the biggest platform. So stay tuned. If you are a developer, if you uh, want to launch a booking service, we offer you uh, not only free software, but we give you a business model to make a profitable company uh, right from the first uh, use of uh, the system. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. <laughs> So he's trying and he's starting to kick the butt of uh, the biggest company on internet uh, for the for the reservation online reservation. Next one, and this is not the first time we met, and it's all the time a pleasure to get this project. Please welcome Daniel. You have eight minutes, including questions. Yeah, I don't know what you did to Adrian, but uh, you have eight minutes. Hi. I'm Joseph Belminster, the CEO and founder at Daniel. Daniel is more uh, an artificial intelligence project than a really blockchain project. So, what is Daniel? This is an artificial intelligence, a smart assistant that is designed to help you daily with your crypto investment. Uh, the goal uh, of this kind of system is to collect all information about the currencies and blockchain over the web to assist you daily. Why? Because searching for information on internet about the currencies and blockchain is really painful. You have more than one million tweets a day about the currencies and blockchain. Millions of videos on YouTube every month, thousands of news every day, and I don't talk about what, what's happening on Reddit, Facebook, Telegram groups, forums, internet. And I'm not even talking about what's happening on the markets every day, on every exchange. 
So this is painful for every user or and every company. This is time consuming. You will find paid content, oriented uh, news and, and news needed to manipulate the market. You will find fake news and you will lose time to check and double check every information. And accessing information is really difficult. Uh, blockchain users need to be assisted in this cryptocurrency jungle. That's why we got it done. An AI smart assistant specialized in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Daniel will be a mobile application with a chatbot uh, that will be able to understand what you're searching for and answer to your question. So basically, if you're saying to Daniel, okay Daniel, um, tell me more about what's happening on the market today, what is the price of the Bitcoin, what people are talking about on Twitter, you will be able to answer you. The phone on the left is my phone. And I think it's yours too. There is a lot of application to check the prices, to check the news fees, uh, my exchanges application. This is, I'm losing time to check every application every day. And what we want at Daniel is to provide you one unique application. So you will save time and you will have every information in one application. And you will be able to interact with Daniel with very cool features like market sentiment, price prediction, and fake news analyzer. We are putting in your hands the power of AI and machine learning for cryptocurrency. We are also providing this tool to professionals like exchanges, um, news websites, banks, VC, so they can use the power of AI to do their risk management and investment. We will show an API and a data visualization to the professionals to help them. We already have an MVP and the mobile application will be launched in October. And for the professional, we can, you can just send an email to contact us to have a, a private demo. Thanks. Thanks. So we have now three minutes for your questions. It's not all the days yet. Uh, with my, you want to? Yeah, um, we are partnering with IBM. We are IBM registered partners. So with IBM Watson, which is, the, in my opinion, the most powerful AI system in the world, uh, we are able to work with Watson API to detect and to analyze the information we are collecting. Uh, I didn't talk about uh, the, the process of, um, of collecting information and how it's working the AI, but basically uh, the system is collecting every information you can find in YouTube, Telegram, forums, everything that was listed uh, before. Uh, and then he is analyzing the information, analyzing the sentiment, analyzing the, um, the, the way this news or this information is, uh, um, is, um, is relayed over, over the web. And with Watson, we are able to say, oh, okay, maybe this news um, is sensible, or maybe this news is oriented because of that, because of the market sentiment is very negative, maybe this is a fake news. And um, this is working pretty well, actually. Okay. Another one? Last one? One minute? Short and sharp? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. The beta, the, the, the beta will be launched in one month, and it will be uh, for iOS and Android. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, because I have a different format of file. All of it, please welcome. Where are the all the best guys? Those guys. Great. Guys, also, I don't know what you made. You have eight minutes to get at everything. Tell me when you're ready. Can I get the microphone too? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, my name is Rich Magel. I'm the CEO of ODA, and I have about 11 seconds to talk to you. Uh, really, uh, a couple points I really want to make. Uh, real quick, hands up. Who, who attended college? Look around. 
93.7% of people will never go to college or even high school. 6.3% students who've gone to college, academic credits do not worth anything if you cross borders. Okay. I can go on and on and talk about what we do or all the statistics in education. I think we all know it's got some problems. ODEM is an automated education marketplace that allows students and providers of education better access to affordable education. Okay, I know, I know. I love the ramble. Anyways, uh, what's really important is that about three days ago, we were invited to the European Union to present our blockchain and education in front of the parliament. We were the only company, or only company, blockchain company to do it. Great thing, here's what I heard. $700 million fund to research and development for blockchain and education. The second thing I love to hear is that they love to work with companies and pilots to test and verify systems into Europe. Lastly, I think was a great also is to keep in mind is that they're very conscious about over-regulating blockchain. So I think this is huge for Europe. I think it's gonna put Europe in the forefront of blockchain and education. There's a lot of issues. Um, Dr. Adele and Johanna will talk about the use cases. They'll describe about the needs, thanks. Okay, we're going to walk you through some uh, some of our use cases for Odom, um, the global uh, blockchain education ecosystem, we like to call it. So starting with uh, what we call educational program staking. This is a model where both educators and students can stake uh, a commitment in a program. So we're in entering into new territory with education these days, and this gives us a chance to figure out what education uh, opportunities people are actually looking for and to not clog up the blockchain, giving them a place and a, a means to actually make sort of a commitment or deposit and to, to put it out there and to crowdsource what might be possible. Okay, and then once a, once a education programs happen in Odom on the blockchain, we have something called our educational repository, our educational activity repository or reports, where now you can see what it looks like if somebody has completed educational activity we create a, a blockchain instance of that activity that then is tied to other metadata in our proprietary system that can give you the information about that particular program. Okay, uh, identity through education. Okay, this is our process of actually credentialing uh, folks and giving them their identity through education. I'm gonna let Dr. Adele talk a little more about this. So this is a little bit uh, dear to my heart. So uh, we have a big refugee problem around the globe. Uh, so like Rohingyas uh, from Myanmar and as well as uh, Syrian here in, in Europe. So a lot of those have uh, credentials, doctors, physicians, engineers, but instead of them actually practicing, they cannot do anything. So they become a call center. We're trying to give them the identity back and give them a means by which they can make a living and become a working force. So using the EER and uh, the IT, the IT is in the instance where there's no university, nobody can actually vouch for you. So we're using consensus um, protocol to actually vouch for each person in the system, and hence they can get their identity back and then uh, participate in the working force. And um, uh, the uh, third part of staging is part of uh, how can you actually help the network as it becomes vibrant with all of the other um, use cases, how can you help uh, smoothen out these operations? And instead of us basically providing all the liquidity, we open it up to uh, token holders. So they will do the staking on behalf of the students and um, uh, educators, and hence they will get part of the fees that we generate on the network uh, itself. And then finally, we are trying to get uh, certifications to happen and map between different countries and uh, education system. Here in Europe, uh, you guys have a leg up on trying to uh, list all the accreditation bodies and there are projects with those in the EU Commission that are going on and we wanna take that to the next level and allow you to map all of those globally so that when you take 
uh, as uh, traded in Aachen, you can actually take it all the way to uh, New York City and basically get credit for it instead of having to retake it again and all parties are authenticated. And then the skill badges are ways for you to maintain all the soft skills that you get throughout your career and take them with you because once you leave one employer, it's harder to really go back and say, here are the things that I actually know to do. Kind of like LinkedIn skills, but it's more focused on your education. And then the training education records, that's uh, similar in terms of the actual thing that you got, educational training and other, so that you can take those with you as well as you move between different employers. Um, in the, uh, this is a very dear one because as an uh, educator myself, when I create a curricula or something like that, that becomes an asset. And it's very hard for me to not give it to people to use and teach, and at the same time, I would like to be rewarded for that. Because we build the infrastructure for the education material and so forth, now I can put it safely on the uh, network and I'm assured that if anybody else will actually teach it, I'll get a reward out of that. So that helps kind of like uh, set up uh, the ecosystem. Think of it as uh, MOOCs, but in a collaborative manner. And then um, the education token sponsorship. This is a situation with a lot of people uh, out there from Europe that want to help others but they can't really trust on uh, how my money is being spent. In uh, the system, you can now uh, get into a smart contract that defines the relation between you and the recipients of the sponsorship on what they need to meet in order for the sponsorship to continue. And if it doesn't, it automatically notifies that. And then you can review that and make sure that it's working. So uh, in short, we try to bring education and we have all those use cases and a little bit more. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, we don't have the time. Uh, we have a little bonus of you have a, you had a little bonus of 30 seconds. Congratulations, brother! Yeah. And uh, so the good news, you can ask questions just after this to them because we are short of time. We are really short in time because you have eight minutes everything included. Okay. So the next one. Yes. Hold that protocol. Please uh, clap your hands for that. And make a warm welcome to Hold that protocol. You have the thing? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Alex, uh, eight minutes. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, today we talk a lot about investment. So we will. Um, so, what is the current problem uh, in the market as we see? It? Of course, the central part of investment is, uh, is uh, exchanges. So uh, there are too many exchanges, and the liquidity is scattered uh, across many of them. Uh, also, you need to multiple accounts for exchanges, and. Uh, uh, the, second, the next problem is centralization in the centralized world. It's a strange thing because we trade cent uh, decentralized token on centralized uh, exchanges. And it's a uh, current situation, but it's uh, for sure will change in the near future. Um, so that's how we see uh, we should uh, solve all this problem. We create a standard universal exchange API it's going to be open source and it will be quite soon, uh, in a month or sooner, which uh, unified, unifies centralized and decentralized exchanges and uh, hide the differences and the complexity of using the centralized exchanges now. Uh, it will have an uh, internal uh, matching agent that uh, do smart routing and order splitting functionality to find the best price among all connected connected exchanges. Uh, so our protocol will always guarantee the best price for buy and sell orders on the market. Uh, uh, we already have better version. Uh, it's in production. You can and go to our site hopeway.com and try it uh, and see how it's uh, simple uh, you can invest in any cryptocurrencies with only one click 
these uh, exchanges that we connected now. Uh, the list of the exchanges will be extended tremendously while we open sourced our API and provide tools for third party developers and uh, uh, businesses to uh, create their own connectors to other exchanges. So we, our core team provides uh, connectors to the major exchanges and uh, the, may, the remains uh, is leave for community. For sure, it's uh, welcome, and uh, 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 we're creating the decentralized uh, applications marketplace where uh, applications run on Holvest and can use uh, the same technology as Holvest built on. Uh, among, among them, it's a shared liquidity uh, pool. Uh, standard API and uh, portfolio management grid indexes and other uh, interested stuff uh, that uh, our protocol will provide. Uh, of course, uh, utility token, uh, uh, there are many, many use cases for that. Uh, our team uh, have great, uh, have huge expertise in that field because um, uh, for example, me, I am chief architect of Waves Decentralized Exchange. It's already more than half and uh, one year and a half on the market. It's uh, one of the major exchanges. Uh, daily volume is above ten million dollars. Um, what it's um, uh, make the, this decentralized exchange unique is that it uh, uh, suits high frequency trader uh, trading as well. So there are bots and uh, that can be run on um, decentralized exchanges. It's some, something unique that because usually it's uh, uh, seen that decentralized exchange is slow, but we solve this problem. Uh, our decentralized exchange is fast. And this trend in decentralization uh, sure uh, exists. All major play gamers like Binance, uh, uh, Bitfenix, uh, Coinbase, other, other central, centralized exchange see this threat from, uh, from us. <laughs> and they're all creating uh, their own um, DEXs version. Uh, we will uh, move forward with uh, this trend and uh, integrate, uh, uh, integrate on the uh, uh, since uh, integrate centralized exchanges as they become more and more popular. So this is our link, try our better, better site, and uh, we will run uh, ICO in mid-August, so welcome, uh, join our community, GitHub, and stay tuned for the talk for this. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe any questions? One question, Sir Tencha. We have one minute. Yes. Sorry. Accounts. Accounts. Okay. Ah, there, are, there are two modes of um, executing orders. Uh, first, uh, a client of our protocol can use their own accounts, uh, provide an API key to the um, to the uh, our protocol, and uh, executing on their behalf. And the next, the next uh, great stuff is a shared uh, liquidity pool, where um, a client of our library can. Uh, stake uh, tokens to escrow smart account and uh, um, stakeholders uh, will execute uh, order requests on their behalf uh, for the client. After order is filled and settlement is done, as, uh, funds on escrow account is released. If anything goes, uh, if it's uh, uh, cancelled, order cancelled, funds return to the client. So there are two modes. You can both execute uh, orders on your account and also lend uh, liquidity from the pool. But in the end, finally, in the end, liquidity goes back to the private wallet? Uh, yes, after, after, the, after the funds goes to the private wallet, uh, funds on the escrow account will be released. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I have a few questions that we are just yeah, Thank you for asking questions. <laughs> We have identified three main issues uh, concerning three different actors of uh, advertising uh, on the internet. First one are web users. They are feeling concerned about their privacy, so they don't want their data to be shared uh, with advertisers. And also, they don't want to see intrusive advertising. We are talking about 11% of the global internet users installing uh, ad blockers. Second uh, are advertisers. We're talking about 15% of their budget being spent on fraud advertising, so fake clicks, fake views, and fake websites. The third actors uh, are publishers who are almost dying for lacking of revenue and monetization of their audience. So, um, Varanida is building a solution for digital advertising and content on blockchain technology to address these three main issues. First, for web users, we are providing them with an ad blocking extension that will allow them to decide whenever they want to see ads, and if they want to see ads, they are going to be rewarded for that. Same thing with their data. If they want to share their data, then they are going to be rewarded. For publishers, they are going to better monetize their audience because with Baranida, 80% of the advertising budget are going to publishers. Also, Varanda helps them to create better paywall that won't impact their conversion rate. Finally, advertisers, they are going to benefit of a fraud-free network, allowing them to spend more on advertising and engage their targeted audience with a transparent network. So with Varanda, we've revolutionized this industry with two main advantages that we have. Blockchain technologies that allow more transparency, decentralization, and most importantly, we give back power to the actors of the Varanida network. On the other hand, uh, our team and our advisors have very strong connection and expertise in this industry, so we believe we can do it. So hello everybody, I'm Kevin De Silva, I'm in the team of Varida, I'm in charge of the financial strategic part and in charge of the conformity uh, aspects. Um, just two minutes, that's right? It's okay. Um, I mean, uh, such projects exist already on internet, uh, and, uh, but uh, we have, Varida has a, a, a real difference with the other projects and for three main reasons. The first one, uh, for example, if I take one of the biggest projects, I won't say the name of this project, it's not fair, but uh, it, they have a huge team, they have millions of users, but uh, they only offer uh, an application and not a real uh, infrastructure, and they cut the relation between the users, the publishers, and uh, the brands. Uh, so all these three parts are completely separated. With Veranda, there will be a real link, a real uh, relationship between these three parts. So it's, uh, it's, uh, we think, we believe that the, the market needs this, this relationship which do not exist today. Uh, the second thing is um, we see several projects with uh, very good uh, technical guys uh, with, who are the pure developers, uh, but they do not have a big experience in the, in the advertising uh, industry. Uh, and so we are humble, but we have uh, in our team the co-founders already 10 years of uh, experience in the advertising uh, industry. And the last thing is that uh, Varanida is an open and evolutive uh, ecosystem. That means that uh, we'll be able to implement other solutions like uh, uh, media uh, payment solutions or, or uh, games applications. So it's, it's something that uh, which will evolve with time. Uh, concerning the ICO, because I have only 20 seconds, uh, it's divided by three steps, three rounds, round 0, 1 and 2, uh, with respectively 30, 10 and 0% discount. Uh, the round 0 is already finished, we are actually in the round 1, which will finish the 15th of August. Uh, it's open mainly to uh, people who can bring something to the project, like uh, on the strategic aspects, or uh, on, uh, on exposure of visibility aspects, the minimum contributions is 3 bitcoins. 
and the public sale will begin after and will finish the 3rd of September and it's open for, for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're well, enjoying our time with good video games and awesome movies. Great. Who remembers this? The other you have to watch this and play this. But during this time, a guy was not scratching his balls watching the TV. He was making something awesome on Amazon.com. Jeff Bezos started Amazon in the 90s while we were doing this. We have to understand one thing. Everyone is an expert. He saw the growth of the internet was huge. He saw that the internet has a huge potential with a growth of uh, 2300 of uh, 2300 percent of growth. And he said, maybe we can make a big library online that we get all the books. And this is how we made Amazon. He picked the goal and he made everything to achieve it as an entrepreneur. This is how in the 90s, like 90s, 2000, Amazon and Alibaba were born. Everyone is an expert. In your job, you are an expert. In your hobby, you are an expert. You can build things and you can, uh, you can see something where to apply the blockchain. So we have interviewed of many blockchain experts. We have studied many programs. And we founded something called the Blockchain Metaverse, where we studied the Blockchain Fundamentals. Who are interested in Blockchain Fundamentals? Just to let you know, a trading is around 4,000 euros when you want to make three days. Finance and trading, you are trading also 3,000 euros. So if you forget two of them, this is this price. If you want to write your own white paper, some people say, okay, you know what? Don't bother, I will write the white paper for you. This is the price in Bitcoin. When you go at ICO box, at least this is the price. I want also a smart contract. I have the idea, but I don't know how to write the right paper. I don't know how to make my smart contract. This is the price for a guy who's going to spend two days writing your smart, con your smart contracts. He will take you, he will write everything for you, he will do the job, and this is what it will come to you, and the knowledge is not in your head. Entrepreneurship also, when you go to entrepreneurship programs, the cost is like 8,000. This is the price. ICO, you want communication and your ICO, this is the end price when you want the training. Tony Robbins said, if you want to lead a revolution, the knowledge has to come from the inside. So we found the Blockchain Masterclass. It's a good couple of ideas with all the subjects we've seen. Everyone can do it. It's plus we add to this six weeks of online training and half a day of dedicated support to your product. Five days of bootcamp training, uh, six weeks of training, and three hours of individual support. This is the price, you don't have this money, and this is the good news, because everything can be for free, because all of you have a budget. It's free, you understood, you have a budget in France, you pay for this, you don't use it, it's called CPF, we are guide Julien. Come on, let's show your beautiful face to all these people. Okay, Julien finds budget for everybody, and we have already 40 people that get the training for nothing. So if you're gonna get trained, if you want to get the revolution for nothing, you have to choose your side. Do you want to be the next Jeff Bezos? If you want to be the next Jeff Bezos, come to Blockchain Masterclass if we can nothing. Or you can choose the next week's sky, uh, the next week sky, uh, side, sorry. Watch TV, watch movie, and don't disrupt the world. It's your choice. If you want to disrupt the world, and at the end it will cost you nothing, go and see Julien. Last time, to the last second. Great, maybe. My new product. Thank you for the introduction. I've been in cybersecurity for 15 years now, and, and, and Adrian asked me that I talk about some cyber threats in cryptocurrency, and I don't have a lot of time, and apparently I also don't have my slides. Um, but, uh, fine, so I thought what I would do is just try to answer one question, one simple but yet very, very important question. What is the best, what, what is the safest, best way to store crypto assets? Where do you keep your money? So, most people, most investors, regular people, will put their money in, their, in the exchange. It makes sense because that's where you want to do the transactions. If there's a fee of putting money in and out of the exchange, you, you don't want to do that, so you just want to keep it in the exchange and have it there. Obviously, the hackers know that. The hackers know that's where the money is, so that's, that will be their prime target. And in the last let's call it three to four years, we have been, we have seen many, many, many cases where exchanges were hacked. And there's a study came out in last, 
don't know, February, that says that in the past 24 months, hackers stole almost one billion dollars from exchanges. So, the next obvious uh, option is to keep your money in a soft wallet, in your computer. So like I said, I have 15 years of experience in cybersecurity. I think I know how to protect my own computer. What about you? Do you have 15 years of experience in cybersecurity? Not so much? How do you know that your computer is safe? How do you know that hackers won't come to your computer and steal your money? And what does that actually mean, stealing your money? They don't steal the actual money from your, your computer. You don't keep your actual money. What you keep is the private keys, the private keys to your wallet. Once they have that, they can get the money, get the, they get the crypto assets from the blockchain itself or from whatever uh, protocol you're, you're using in the crypto coins. So you have malware today, you have viruses and trojans that are designed to go to your computer, look for private keys and steal them. You also have other stuff. One of my favorite malware of all times is something that came out three months ago in March 2018 and did something very, very stupid and genius. It looked at your clipboard because addresses for wallets and, uh, are just very, 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 very long strings. We don't type them, we copy and paste them. So what it, this malware did, this token did, is it, took, it looked for cryptocurrency uh, addresses and changed it. So when you copied and when you pasted, it, it wasn't the same thing. And, you, and you, you sent money to the wrong place. And you were human. We don't look, we don't verify, we don't think about all of this. It's copy-paste, it's something you do without thinking. So nobody verified and they were able to steal about $5 million that way. So, if, uh, by the way, this is not just for Windows, if anybody is thinking this, it's the same thing for Linux, it's the same thing for Mac, for Mac. It's, they're vulnerable just the same. And moreover, if you're thinking, okay, if not, the, if not the computer, what about software wallets in my mobile phone? Anybody use a, a mobile wallet here? Great. How do you know that you downloaded it for somewhere, you downloaded it from the App Store or from the Google Play, how do you know it's a real one and not a fake one? There are, there have been in the last six months, 10,000 confirmed cases of fake wallets in the Android Play Store. There have been 5,000 events in the iOS app, app Store. So, when you download an app, you need to, need to make sure that you download the right app. And of course, there's malware to mobile phones as well. Which brings us to the last option you have, the, you know, in, in French, the creme de la creme, right? The hardware wallets. This supposedly super safe, super, nothing can be stolen from them. And that's, of course, is not true. Number one, five months ago, there has been a vulnerability confirmed in Ledger. A kid, a 15 year old kid from the US found a way to steal money from Ledger. Number two, Ledger is just a place where you keep money. When you want to actually do transactions, you need to connect it to the internet. You need to connect it to a phone or to your computer, which brings us right back to the problem that I already stated. So, what I want to say is, A, nothing is safe. Nothing is the best choice. Nothing is the safest choice. You are investors. You should know a thing, a thing called risk management. You should know a thing about calling diversifying your risk. Put stuff in different places. Think about what you are willing to lose and what you are willing to gain and how much is it valuable to you. Be aware of the risks and think about what you can personally do, not the technology, not which technology is best for you, what you can personally do to keep your money safe. And if you don't know what to do, consult with an expert. Thank you very much. Merci, merci. Une question dans la salle. What is what, what should we do? It's like I said. So I have, I have software. I have software wallets on my computer. I have money in the exchange. I don't have a, a hardware wallet because I, I honestly don't invest so much that I feel it's worth it. But if I, if I, if I had a lot of 
cryptocurrency, I would probably get a, a hardware wallet. So like, I, I put various stuff in various places. I don't keep everything in the same place. Worst case scenario, I lose some money, not everything. Well, <laughs> uh, I bought a ledger. I'm not sure it was uh, necessary. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci. My name is uh, Zaradin Tuak. Um, I'm the co-founder of um, a company called Burton. So Burton is a, a liquidity provider. So we do the market making for token companies that are going to be listed or and we have an OTC desk where we buy and sell uh, large volumes of uh, cryptocurrencies for mainly professional investors such as private banks, investment funds, etc. Et um, the other hat I have is that I am the co-founder of a non-profit called uh, the, the AFGC, Association Française pour la Gestion de Cybermonnaie. This non-profit was uh, co-founded by uh, me and my associates and PricewaterCooper. The law firm Gip Loire et Noël, the custodian bank uh, Cassis from the Philippe Jacques Group, uh, the investment fund uh, Eiffel, and uh, the, ex the, the French uh, <coughs> cryptocurrency exchange uh, Penium. So, this, this, uh, this non profit is uh, the, the goal of this non profit is to lobby at the, the governments, the, um, the, the regulators, and all the other actors that have uh, an impact on the on the regulation or on the taxes uh, to develop the, um, the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So in this uh, in this job, we uh, we meet a lot of uh, regulators, uh, the, the, the ministers uh, of uh, economy, uh, etc. In France, and that's what I am going to tell you about um, the, the, the the way it is going to be shaped. And how we how we see it from uh, from our perspective. So, uh, exactly, uh, we're going to tell uh, our international and French guests um, about the ICO re the, the regulation in France, uh, because there's uh, I've heard that it's going to be a little bit more liberal than before. So. Uh, can you briefly explain to us the current situation and what can be expected in the future? So what we already have um, in France is uh, what we call a visa that has been issued, is going to be issued by the AMF for the ICOs. What we talked about uh, in, the, in the tax, uh, tax uh, presentation was on, on, only also for uh, retail people, so it was not for companies. So I will come also to tax after for, for companies. So the, the, the visa of uh, the AMF is, a, is an optional visa where an, an ICO company can ask for this visa if uh, this company is complying to a certain uh, rules. For example, they, uh, they might have to, to have an escrow, they might have to, to, to bring some transparency on the, the banking accounts, uh, to, um, to, to have a hard cap, a soft cap, and many, others, uh, many other uh, points like this. And if they are compliant, the, the, the AMF that they are compliant, they will give this visa. The idea is to, to bring uh, potential um, great uh, projects to France and to filter the scams uh, in France uh, naturally. Um, the, the, the other um, field where the, 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 the public policies are, are moving right now is the, the tax, the taxation. In terms of taxation, so they are, they are moving in, in, uh, in the retail field uh, with uh, some uh, some uh, some new concepts. For example, at the moment they wanted to do uh, to, to have a, a flat tax. Uh, it's not very um, very uh, very suited for, for the situation. So it, it is even moving further uh, with uh, some maybe uh, some new uh, new ways of uh, taxing uh, uh, cryptocurrencies that are more suited to the to the, to the ecosystem. And we, we are not uh, yet fixed on how how it will be, but uh, we are sure that it is moving. And it's going to be uh, very innovative. Um, in terms of uh, taxation, also uh, the, 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 the ICO companies are, uh, are very um, very concerned because uh, they are taxed, for example, sometimes with the VAT, the TVA, uh, and also with the, the ES, the, uh, the company tax. And sometimes, for example, uh, some ICOs have to give uh, half of what they raise to the 
the tax administration. So this is not suitable to be attractive and it, it is going to move also. Uh, the, the other field that we're seeing is the secondary market. So, um, for example, the IMF uh, took a position uh, on the primary, primary, primary market with the ICOs, and now they are moving to the secondary market with the exchanges and the, the broker dealers. Um, so that, that is what we are expecting. In terms of banking, there is nothing to be expected uh, at least for a year. Um, in terms of, uh, I had some points. I don't have the presentation, so I don't remember. Uh, in terms of KYC, AML, the, the exchanges are already compliant uh, because of the, the European regulation, but uh, um, the, 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 the ICOs are not, uh, do not have an obligation, for example, to do a KYC. Uh, neither the broker here, so we, we could expect something like this, and we are pushing it uh, at, at our uh, association. And uh, in terms of investment funds, it is not yet possible to do an investment fund uh, that will invest in, uh, in cryptocurrencies directly uh, for tax reasons uh, mainly, because uh, the, the, the investment vehicle that will be able to to host those uh, those tokens. Uh, could only be a company at the current stage of the, the regulation, of the, the legislation, and therefore they will be taxed at uh, 30 percent, uh, at leaving 30 percent as a com tax company, and this is not suited as an investment vehicle needs to be transparent for investors. Um, so it might change. It's not the priority because there is a kind of. Um, the, 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 the governments and the, the ministry are, they, they are afraid of uh, the, the systemic risk that could provide uh, that could uh, that could provide uh, the cryptocurrencies if they are uh, if, they, if they if they come into uh, into the, the, the public uh, hands and they come become mainstream with these investment vehicles um, available for everyone. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask.